Vamos a continuar entonces con... So, let's go on with our tutorial. Remember that uh, you can uh, come uh, to, your, to the mics and ask questions. Please ask any doubt you may have. Uh, those of you, of you who are via Zoom, uh, please uh, write down uh, your questions in the Q&A panel and uh, you're going to receive the answers as we move along. Now I'm going to give the floor to Erika and she will continue to show you what she had already started, how to create the rowers in the Mil Milaknik system. Hello. All right. So let's resume. Where had we stopped? I was showing you the Milaknik system and I was explaining how to handle the Milaknik platform to create the rowers with the information requested by the platform and how we can see what we created. You may remember that when I mentioned uh, the uh, uh, data that we needed to bear in mind when speaking of rowers. I talked about a policy that was approved uh, in November, in April 2023, because in the past for the resources that had been sub-assigned, we didn't have a chance to uh, manage them and create the digital certificates for those resources. Thanks to the approval of that policy, we can already manage them when, uh, when uh, they they, are, they were created by other organizations. When we are the final um, entity and we uh, use IPv6 uh, addressing and maybe our internet um, uh, provider, uh, our ISP uh, sent it. So those are not resources that we receive directly from LACNIC, but uh, they, these are resources that have been sub-assigned. And thanks to these policies, we uh, can manage them and generate these uh, ROAS to fulfill the part of the RPKI. It is there that uh, we have sub-assigned resources and we are in the MILACNIC system. In the right of the system, you can visualize the resources that are uh, subside here in the next slide. Let me show you, for instance, here we have an example of, here it appears as a uh, as not administered by my organization. Those are the sub objects and uh, from the Milaknik system, I can generate the ROAS. As a matter of fact, in the system, it shows us the information on how this is being published. Here they are disaggregating this. Here. In this case, if you realize uh, prefix 19 is being published in full, a slash 20, a slash 21, that are not uh, disaggregating, and uh, that is how you should create the rollers. You can also see, for instance, in the number of networks that we are announcing, you can see the three validity states of uh, all of the networks that we announce, how many of them are valid, not valid, and not found, and for the valids that were created in the Milaknik system, and how many received uh, those changes, and you see them in uh, the repository of uh, the regional internet repositories. So, we already saw the theory of uh, the validation infrastructure. Now we'll go to the demo of the RPKI part in this demo, if you remember when I explained the validation infrastructure. And uh, um, we see here the validating cache where we have the border routers where we received uh, all of the routes and we saw the repository of the internet registries where we have the information of the validating so uh, here we are going to see more in detail teacher will show you on the screen we'll see the details 
Um, what is the information that we see in these files that get generated, for instance, in a CSV, where you have a list of the certificates, the ROAs, and the information shown by the validator. Here we're going to show the Ford validator. This is, this is one of those softwares that are installed in the server. Later on, I'm going to give you more uh, details of this validator. And we're also going to need your assistance for this demo so that you deliver us information, either of a segment of uh, addressing that you publish or autonomous system so that we can show information in a validation software to show you how the route table is uh, seen because these are the attributes that we will have at BGP. The, and this will show you this uh, either valid, not valid, or not found. So before uh, showing the demo for you to understand this better. Uh, we'll show you a demo of what you receive from the validator. Here, let me give you the detail of the validators. Remember that in, in that infrastructure that I showed earlier, uh, how the validation uh, of origin works, we have the validating caches that are these uh, small servers that we have here that uh, connect and bring uh, the information from uh, the uh, internet uh, uh, registries. Here we are going to provide information of the validation software that is installed in these servers, the so-called uh, validating software. As to the validation software, we have um, different uh, software that is available that you can download and uh, install in your servers. We have a validating software, the uh, Octo RPKI and Go RTR that were uh, developed by Cloudflare. This is a validating software that is very popular among contents providers in the CDNs. And well, that would be the software that we would install to bring the information of those repositories. Then we have the Routinator 3000, that's another validating software developed uh, by the Analyt Labs, uh, Labs, and it's very efficient when requesting the resources of the server where you are going to uh, include the RAM and uh, CPU. Um, it's, uh, and in the, the demo, we are going to use the Ford validator. That is the validator that was developed by LACNIC and Nick Mexico. That will have it. It's divided into two components. The validator as such, that is the validating software that we're going to show. And another part that is Ford monitoring. We're going to show that in the demo. You see how to use that tool to see how we are uh, publishing things and how we should create the rules. This validator is um, quite uh, light and you can uh, execute it in a, in a virtual machine. These validators are a free use. You can download them and install them in your server, in the server you choose, to um, make them operate in uh, the validation structure, if that's what you wish. This is the Ford validator. Remember that the presentation that we see here in the tutorial is uh, and uh, the event uh, website, you enter the agenda and the tutorials. There you have the tuto our tutorial, New Trends for Secure Routing. There you can download the presentation. And there you'll have all the links that we've shown, all the tools, all the additional information of what we are explaining here. So here you have the link that would take you directly to download this uh, validation software and general information of how to install this and how to use this validating cache. So this is a validator that was developed by LACNIC and Nick uh, Mexico. And the um, resources, uh, resource requirements are quite low. They're quite uh, accessible, so you can install it also in a virtual machine. 
So uh, before going to the tools, let's go to the demo. Como les decía. So let us start with a demo. And to see the RPKR part, let me show you how these rowers can be viewed. Access the validator. We're going to use the Ford validator to show you some of the files that we have here and that are important in the validator. So can we have the presentation on the screen for the demo? What we're going to see then, the idea is to show you how the Ford validator works. and what it looks like when you download it. This is the Fort Valley configuration. This is a basic configuration where we indicate where some of the directories will be. The TAL, which is, a, as I said today, when I showed you that tree with the RPKI, this is a root certificate. And that root certificate is found here for each regional registry we have a file showing where that root certificate is located on which this RPKI depends. The local repository where it's going to save the things provided by the validator and what we put over here is a file generated by ROAS in CSV format so we can visualize them. So if you look at the directory etc slash fort slash tal, here we have the trust anchor locators of the original red registers. We show them which are the trust anchors. You can only keep the information of LACNIC only, but you wouldn't have the information from the other registers. But here we have the five regional registries. So we can see what the TAL of LACNIC has. Basically, you see where you find the NTTs and the trust anchor locator. And this is the cryptographic information. So this is just so that you see what this is about, the repository, for example, is in slash local fort. Here you have the subdirectories. If we go to LACNIC. There you can see all the information which is brought by the validator. You will be able to see it at simple sight. This has a ROA. Each repository will bring the data, and that will be in the machine where the validator is. Now, this is more for the purpose of analyzing this from the standpoint of the software, you won't be able to see it so easily. So that is why we created this file, roas.csv, which has 616,017 lines, roas that were created. So if we look at the roas.csv, we can see that for each of the rows, the autonomous system, the prefix, and the maximum length. You will recall that rows had that the prefix, the maximum length of disaggregation, and the origin ASN. So these are the rows. We said that the rows are objects similar to the IRRs. These are signed cryptographically. 
What this did over here was to bring the LACNIC repositories and from all the other registries. Valid it did the cryptographic validation, namely to verify that all the rowers and all the information, the certificates, is correct. If there is an invalid certificate, this will invalidate the rower, and the rower will be found in this file. So once all that process takes place, what we have now are the list of rowers, which is ultimately what we're interested in. So historically, we saw how to create the rowers and be LACNIC. Once that is done, LACNIC creates the repositories with the cryptographic information. Then someone with a validator downloads that information, validates the information cryptographically with the software, and generates the rowers list, not only the one created by Erica, but also the one each one of you created, as well as those created in the other regional internet registers. You saw that we had a file, a database, that dot TAL, the trust and locator, was for all the internet registers. So with all that information, we have 600,000 rowers. This is an immense file, and of course, we're not going to look at it completely, but we're going to look for the ASN 28,000, which is LACNOGS. And then we have the rowers it created. So these are all the rowers created by LACNOG. No, 28,000 is not LACNOG, it's LACNIC, it's LACNIC. Yes, I was wondering about that too. So LACNOG's ROA is... But anyway, the point beyond seeing LACNIC's or LACNOG's ROA, the point is that you help us provide information from your autonomous system so we can validate what is the information we can visualize in the repositories. If you created a ROA and you wish to validate it, you can do so so we can get the AS, the autonomous system. And this is you do with the IR. If those connected by Zoom, please send the information on the, on the autonomous system you wish us to validate so we can check this out in the demo we have. Remember that here, we are doing the query from the validating cache. Uh, microphone, the person, this is from the ambassador's program. The microphone isn't working very well. 727678. I also wanted to make a comment on the fourth validator. We installed that in NIC Chile. In the instructions for installing this and deploying it, it was quite straightforward. So I invite you to do this because this has been done very well. And the interaction, if you have any questions, we have the support system. We have quite a good support system. We respond quite rapidly. So in general, we have a great experience with the validator. It doesn't consume so many resources with the server. So that was great for us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. So, going to, so this is the autonomous system of NIC Chile. This is LACNOG. <laughs> the one they had. This is a real LACNOG. Yes. So. 27678. So there, you see all the rowers. We can see this one over here. The autonomous system will always be the same, of course. But here we have an IPv4 prefix, which is a slash 23, and can be disaggregated in 24. Three IPv6 prefixes. 
that haven't been disaggregated. It only has slash 48, then another slash 23, and this can be disaggregated into slash 24, and these here too. Cuando ustedes ponen esto, por ejemplo, over here, 200.1.120.0 will be pleasures with autonomous system of origin, which is 27.678, and this will be published as a slash 22, but could be viewed as a slash 23 or slash 24. When we view this in this way, slash 22, comma 24 means that the prefix can be viewed in the internet as 22 or any other number up to 24. So in that way, if you wish to disaggregate this, you can publish the disaggregated prefix. If you didn't put 24 or 22, comma 22, and you published 24, that would be considered invalid because it is being published with a different length to the one that was specified. And because this is more specific, what we wish to avoid is precisely that. That someone publishes what we saw at the beginning, a prefix that is more specific with this, your same prefix. So that's why it is important to clearly specify what is a maximum number with which it will be specified. If you say a slash 22, you won't be able to plush, uh, publish a 23 or a 24. And if you publish them, these will be considered invalid. So those are the rowers that were created by this autonomous system. Do we have another one? Yes, in the Zoom, we got one, I think. Let me check. Eighty four eight eight from Can TV, Yuvan Basias from Venezuela from Can TV. And then we have one from Bolivia. Well this one has a lot. Here for example, as I was saying, this prefix over here of Can TV is a slash fifteen and the maximum disaggregation is fifteen. So if you publish this as sixteen it would be invalid. You can only publish this as a slash 15. Then you have other ones that are disaggregated, a slash 24, 32. This would be for some specific use. And there are a large number of prefixes, as you can see, that the row was created for a large number of prefixes, a slash 23, which can be disaggregated in 24. And this over here is a slash 15 with maximum disaggregation 24, a slash 13, maximum disaggregation slash 24. So you have a large number of prefixes because this is a large network. So you will note that for each of the prefixes published in the internet, they create the ROA and they are specifying the maximum disaggregation they will have. We have other further autonomous systems from, from the Bolivian Space Agency, 26, 87, Pedro Camaro shared this one. This has IPv6 and IPv4. The previous one also had an IPv6 prefix. And this one over here has IPv4 a slash 22, which can be disaggregated until a slash 24. So you create this row and then you can disaggregate it when you do the announcements and you won't have any issues there. 6568, another autonomous system. This one is also quite big. I don't know who sent it, who sends it. I think this was the one from Genoveva Espejo, who we saw had several objects created in the IRR. Yes, I think it's that one. So this one also contains a lot of networks. 
maybe the comma was missing here. So what we can have a look at is some of the networks in Fort Monitoring to see what they look like. There are many cases where when we publish the prefixes where we don't know whether these are large IRRs or if a disaggregation was done for some of the prefixes and maybe personally are not aware of that. So we'll create rowers, but we're not sure whether some of the prefixes were disaggregated. So in those cases, there are tools that we can use that are open source and allow us to visualize these and show us which are the prefixes that we are publishing. So all the list. Or also, for a specific prefix we receive from LACNIC, it shows us how we are publishing it, if it's being disaggregated, if it's being published uh, in a, s a summarized way. In the case of Fort, when I spoke about the validator, has two sides. We have the validator, which is a software going to set up at the server side, and then we have Fort Monitoring, which you can access or visualize through the web. This is one of those tools that allows us to do queries with a num na number of the autonomous system with a prefix, IP4, IPv6 prefix, to see how this is being published and how this is being visualized in the internet so we can use this information and know how to create these certificates or ROAs. So right now, well, this over here is the Fort Monitoring website. It has a part that it has the general statistics that you can see, for example, the percentage of IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes that were covered or not covered by RPKI in the region. Then you can also look at the percentage of valid, invalid, or not found prefixes. Here, for example, we see that the majority are valid prefixes. This has changed considerably in recent years. Then you can also have a look at the percentage of prefixes considering validation from the IPKI standpoint and the RRR standpoint. This is something you can check in detail. But now let's have a look at the more technical aspect of the technical reports. So let's check this out based on the prefix we saw previously. Here we have the one from Venezuela, the autonomous system of CAN TV. The slash 24 shows us that there is a rower. This is how it is published, a very simple rower. The valid origin, 8048. The prefix is slash 24, maximum length 32. And down here, you have in the last days, October 6th, 5th, and 4th of October, you see what this looks like in the global routing tables. Here you see, for example, the last announcements in these days were announced by AT48, so this is a RPKI valid classification. This is very useful, as Erica was saying, to check out whether a prefix, our own prefix or someone else's prefix, what this look like, looks like, or does it appear as valid or not. So this is how we can view it. Let me write this example, 200, 0, 88, 0, slash 24. And this is an anycast lacnic prefix that appears as a RPK valid prefix. In the case in the event of this being announced with an autonomous system of a different origin, it would appear as invalid. And if didn't have RPKI, if didn't have the ROA, it would appear as not found. So this is a valid prefix. Okay. 
So let's look this up by autonomous system. So here, for instance, from Nick Chile, there we put it uh, by our autonomous system, and we can see all the prefixes they are publishing. Here you have the date of each of the prefixes and uh, the autonomous system uh, of origin, that's 678. And uh, here, there are, for some reason, these two prefixes, slash 48, uh, have no rows created, and uh, so they consider them as not found. This is the same, but uh, October the 5th, so we, they take the first days of publications, and uh, they are taking this uh, as uh, the uh, tables that are processed uh, through the uh, RIPE RIS uh, or RAUDIO systems. Those are two different projects that col collect global um, uh, routes, and we can draw the uh, data from there. That is how you see it in the internet. All this is valid. And here there are two that are published as not found. They don't have an arrow A created. So you have two there. Yes, sure, they were not created. And um, they have and uh, that is why these tools are quite useful, and they also give us a chance to talk of the other tools that we have for the validation. So we let's see what we saw in the demo. We uh, checked uh, the validations after the fort, and we took the validation uh, software. We saw how you see those files. Uh, so uh, that is what we call the anchor locators that Guillermo pointed out. Um, these are the root certificates that are the regional uh, uh, registries that uh, generate those certificates, and they bring all the information of the global uh, ROAS, and those cache validators will bring them to our network to inform our routers. That is where we have our routing table, all the networks that we start to know, and to deliver the uh, um, uh, the state uh, valid, not valid, and not found. So we saw in Ford how we can see that information by autonomous system, that validation of the prefixes that are published as origin, the autonomous system of origin, what are the public, the ones that, uh, and as I said, this demo will absolutely complement with uh, the secure routing um, uh, seminar that we're going to have this afternoon, because the, the, this afternoon you're going to validate, you're going, you do get to be client, and you're going to be service provider, and you'll see how the validation system works, the full thing. And you'll see how you visualize the validation status um, in uh, the routing table. We saw this tool that is for monitoring. This tool enables us to make queries either through IPv4, IPv6, or the autonomous number to see how the routes are being published. Once you have that information, in many cases, either we don't know or we start working, for instance, at a NOC or uh, operating a network, and we don't know how many prefixes that network has assigned, or we can know the prefixes assigned, but we don't know whether it was a slash 19 or slash 22, whether it's being disaggregated or not. So we can conduct a query with one of these tools to know how the prefixes are being published and to create the ROAS. Then, 
We can uh, go back to the presentation. Then, so we are going to have, for instance, we had the case of autonomous system uh, that uh, Celsa gave us of Chile, where we saw that we had a long listing of IPv4 and IPv6 uh, prefixes for which AROA had been created. But, uh, and uh, sooner or later, and uh, the, well, the, uh, there is not operated by one person, but a group of operators, and at some time uh, they may have uh, published a new route, and we don't, we may not know whether we need to create a new ROA or whether there's a new disaggregation or a, an update. So there are tools that help us automate the monitoring process so that we may receive a notification to our mail telling us that there was a change in our autonomous system in our segment so that we uh, that tells us whether we have to update the creation of those certificates so the tools that i want to discuss are these these are the tools and they enable us uh, to identify whether there were any changes in our routes in our BGP, uh, to know whether we have to update anything in the creation of our ROAS in uh, the operation of this RPKRI part. So, for instance, there are ROAS that, uh, well, they may um, they may lose validity because not, not because of a due date, but because they have been updated. And if we don't update it, we start invalidating that publication. So if somebody stands to tell me the principle that is present in the validation of uh, origin, the RPKI, to indicate whether a route is valid and valid or not found, which of those two things that you validate to call uh, that route? Could please, could you, could some of you uh, take the microphone and tell us? Let's see. I'm Matthias. All right, now I'm from Claro, Argentina. And what the autonomous system would, uh, uh, needs is the the origin and the prefix. Good, good. That's that's a principle, the only principle that we need to know about, and uh, the only thing that uh, RPKI validates to, if it meets that principle, it, then for for instance, we can respond to uh, incidents like the hijacking incidents where they come and replace or they start publishing a prefix from a different autonomous system. So that is an telling us that something is wrong. So considering that prefix, if we change or we start publishing a route, we have disaggregated, for instance, and we only created the ROA, indicating that the prefix that I'm publishing is a 22 uh, prefix no, with no disaggregation, and I start disaggregating it by delivering 24 prefixes, and I start to publish it. I'm going to invalidate that route, and all the systems that are validating it will show it as an invalid route. So that is why we need something. We may be, it's not that we are constantly looking at the routing table, or we looking at the tools uh, that uh, report changes. Let me briefly tell you of these two tools. We have uh, the BGP Alerter. That's a tool that was uh, developed by NTT. It's an open source tool. And uh, there you have the GitHub link through which you can download it. It's open source. You can install it. It needs to be installed in some server. Uh, and this will allow you to do BGP monitoring. That we are going to monitor the autonomous system uh, so that it will send us notifications if there were any changes. So we monitor the BGP operations and the RPKI, the validation part. And then we have the other tool that is the packet VIS that does the same thing. 
This uh, BGP alert is quite a good tool and it enables us to visualize the entire route, the entire tree through which uh, our um, announcements uh, go and where there are incidents of, of uh, route leaks in real time. We have advertisements telling us that there's been a change in uh, the uh, routes. And uh, packet vist does exactly the same thing as the BGP alert, but it doesn't. There's no need to install it in a server, but we can access, it as we did in the monitoring for Ford via web. Yeah, there's no need for you to install it. We enter a website that we put the information of the autonomous system that we want to monitor, and it's going to start monitoring, and there we can select. Uh, the means through which we want notifications to reach us, if we want it uh, through via an email or via Slack or other means, um, sending us notifications of whether we're, if, if there were any changes to this, we'll be monitoring the autonomous system. And if you visualize, for instance, that it starts publishing a new prefix from our autonomous system or in a different way, it's going to send us a notification. And it is there that we'll know whether we have to update our certificates or our ROAS. So we leave these uh, tools that uh, are of some usage and uh, we use uh, packet packet base is quite popular because it doesn't need to install them and if you need those tools you can approach us anytime during this event and we can explain how you can use it remember they're open source you don't have to pay but packet vis if you have one more than one as to monitor you do have to pay an annual fee but if you're going to monitor one single asn there's you don't have to pay at all useful tools Ah uh, well, of course, the Milaknik link, uh, this is where you're going to generate the ROAS. We already explained it step by step. We have these tools. Um, forward monitoring, we saw that this is a, a Laknik tools uh, and InfoRedis and uh, um, these. Uh, here you can ask uh, uh, for autonomous systems and uh, uh, prefixes so that you can uh, find out uh, who a certain resource belongs to. And then RIPE uh, RIS, that is one of the tools that uh, uh, Ford uh, monitoring brings uh, the information from. And here you can see a lot of BGP information of autonomous system or an IP prefix. There are courses specifically at the LACNIC campus that uh, approach this. You have the basic BGP course. It's quite comprehensive and it's important to uh, see it uh, to, so, because you'll see how many attributes you have in the BGP and how you can use the configurations of our network. But there's a more advanced course that is in the advanced courses part. And remember that Campus uh, LACNIC has a specialization part. You have basic, uh, medium, and advanced courses. And among the latter, you have the security for BGP course focusing fully on the use of these mechanisms that we saw in today's tutorial. So this is highly recommended. If you have uh, resources assigned by LACNIC, then you have the right to enter these courses, uh, to attend these courses free of charge. They're quite good. It's a very extensive uh, topic, but you'll see the more specific things and you'll get more detailed information of everything that we are explaining in four hours. And uh, some documentation of our PKI that we are sharing there. So let's see what we've seen so far. Here you can you may ask uh, questions about what we've seen so far, but remember that we started uh, with how to conduct a query in the database of the uh, internet routing registries, how to conduct those simple queries. 
and, uh, you have to say the autonomous system and how you can use the information of those uh, queries to generate automatic filters, for instance, using tools such as BGPQ4 and how to create those objects from the Milaknik uh, systems. We saw that in the service part, we have RIR, and there we can generate the uh, road, road six uh, and uh, the ASC. So we, you have a list of ASNs that we are providing transit to, and how we can generate from that Milaknik platform. So we saw validation of origin, we saw the validation structure, we saw that we have the routers that receive the complete routing table through BGP, the cache validators, we saw the different cache validators that we have, we saw the fault validator in our demo as well as the principles that have to bear in mind in the sense of how RPKI works as well as the information required to create the ROAS, those digital certificates that, as was mentioned here, is the autonomous system with which the route is originated or published and how it is published, whether summarized or disaggregated. We also saw how to create ROAS in the Milaknik system, what information we have to take into account, as well as the different tools we can use to validate how we're making our announcements, as well as those tools we can use to notify whether there have been changes at BGP level or also the internet, the things we publish in the internet, so as to update the generated certificates. So far, so good. Con toda la información, por favor. Good afternoon. Sebastian Saavedra from Argentina. The validation software has to be like a local resource or is it a public resource? Thank you. This validation software, in fact, is a local resource that we're going to have enabled and if we see the need for validation in our infrastructure. so. When we can speak about having the need of doing validation in our infrastructure is when we use, or rather, when we do routing of a large number of different networks, for example, transit to different autonomous systems, where we have to visualize at all times if there have been any changes in the routing table. Let me give you an example. If I'm an end user, an entity that only has an IPv4 and IPv6 resource, it might be that I have an AS or not, but everything is published through my internet service provider. So I wouldn't have the need of doing uh, origin validation in my infrastructure because I only manage my resources. I don't manage external resources. So any changes depend on me. If I do disaggregation or if I change things internally, I start publishing a public network to the internet. I know what it is, so we're not managing a large amount of external network information. But if we are an internet service provider, and if we receive information from many different customers, from different networks, from different autonomous systems, then I do have a, the need for having a validation infrastructure with a repository of a local validation software. This is necessary so that we can connect to the border routers where we have the routing tables. So this does have to have be a validating software installed locally in our infrastructure. So through a network, it can connect to those routers containing that routing table. And because I'm managing information, I'm already providing transit to external networks, to different autonomous system numbers that I don't manage, which can change in their networks. You might start publishing a new network. You can start disaggregating or assigning new information to your customers, which I'm unaware of. But the only way to visualize this is through that validation, through that monitoring, which allows me to see in my routing table changes or I might be visualizing a route 
that appears with this new attribute as invalid. So in that case, I would take action on the border of my network and see whether I have to filter it or not. I don't know whether this answers your question or if I was clear. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Good question and very necessary too. Any more questions in the Zoom, in the chat box? Yes, there are questions. So can we have the link of the monitor? So the link for FOT monitoring, let me remind you, the event site LACNIC 42, you can enter the agenda, you access the tutorial section, which is in yellow on Monday. You will find the name of our tutorial, which is New Trends in Secure Routing. And there you have the presentation of what we have been doing, showing you today. So there you have all the links. There you have a link to access Fort Monitoring. Fernando from Telefonica Uruguay, I'd like to ask a question regarding ROS. If I have a traffic balancing system, you will have to do publication for each prefix. So you have to a ROA for each prefix you publish. Yes, with different autonomous systems, no, with the same autonomous system, but with different slashes, slash 22, slash 23, slash 24. Great question, yes, because the same thing happens here. We follow the same principle. In the example Guillermo shared with you, if we have a segment and we disaggregate the segment, the minimum you will be doing, this is an IPv4 prefix, and you received a slash 19, and you're disaggregating that into slash 24s, you generate the ROA from 19 through 24. So there you're covering all the networks you published up to the slash 24. You don't need to generate one for each. Does that answer your question? Good. So you don't need to generate one for the 22 slash 23 and so on. If you generate it in that way, you're covering all the publications through to slash 24. Now, the only thing is that if the autonomous, changer, the autonomous system changes from which you will be generating these for another one, then in that case, you have to generate a different ROA indicating that autonomous system and the other one through which you are also publishing it. Any more questions? There's a question in the Q&A of Zoom. What problems might you come across due to incorrect or outdated information in the IRRs? That is an interesting question because that is precisely one of the problems the IRRs have. Very often, this is incorrect or outdated information. I mentioned today that the IRRs have been around for quite some time now, since the 90s. So as time went by, organizations start putting information there, but very often it's not updated. So it might occur that the information is outdated when you go and check and do your configurations, for example, how to set up your router. So if the information is not correct, this will not be of any use. So it might occur that there are organizations that published the networks and the prefixes and the autonomous system used to publish a given prefix, but then this changed over time and others were added, but the previous ones were not deleted. So in those cases, if you create the filters or if you base yourself on that information which is not updated, then you might have problems because you might be taking things, information that is considered correct, but in fact it's obsolete. So it's important when you manage an autonomous system to check what has been published in the IRR. And as I was saying, that is one of the most common problems IRRs have. And also in the case of IRRs, it is somewhat different 
compared to the, in, in the sense of the authorization model. It is the autonomous system that creates this information. So sometimes an autonomous system is creating information in the IRR for its clients, but it's not the client. In the case of our PKI, however, the IP addresses, V4 and V6, are the ones who create the information. So in this way, less errors are likely to occur. In the IRR, each internet provider that has a given client creates the objects. And when that client goes from one provider to another, not only the new objects are there, but also the older ones. So a lot of outdated information is produced there. And that is an issue that IRRs have. And in fact, if that is not updated, it will be that useful. So no more questions? Over here, question. I speak from Peru. The audio is very bad here. I have several questions based on the IRR and also regarding the resources. Our ISP has rent, had a slash rent lease slash 22. The question is if you can create a row RPKI for those prefixes or have to use the IRR in the database. So the provider who gave that resources is cogent. What we would have there, I was speaking about this policy that was approved last year and answered that issue of depending on the resource provider, the broker or the ISP that is providing this addressing or leasing the addressing. So in that policy approval, these Sub-assigned resources can be managed from BLACNIC, and those rows can be created. Now, the point is that we have to validate whether that cogent prefix is from the region if it was assigned by LACNIC. Ah, no, claro, si no. No sería. So, in that case, cogent is not from the region. This is a policy that only applies to the Latin American and Caribbean region. So, that is a broker from outside. So, if you, you depend on them, to create the rowers. So that is why this is very important. It's important that you are aware of this because you, as a requirement, when you uh, sign an agreement to lease IPv4 addresses and so on, this should be included as a requirement in your contract. They should deliver that resource, but with that type of certificates already created. In that case, they have the capacity of creating a rower. They have to do that directly, not you as a customer, but Cogent has to direct generate those certificates. So you have to indicate to Cogent what is the prefix they're leasing, how they're publishing it, if you are disaggregating it, because the autonomous system is publishing this so that they can create the rower. I have another question regarding the IRR. A while ago, you mentioned that the rower has to have the maximum and minimum length for the prefix. So as we're working with an IRR for a slash 24, but in addition to that, we created four IRRs of slash 24 that are disaggregated. So it can it work in that way or only for the first slash 22 IRR? Well, in that case, it is important to clarify two things. Remember that what you are created are the rowers. These are the digital certificates. The IRR is a database where you can create objects. This would be the route, a route six ob object, which are the networks you publish in the internet. So in this case, the question you're asking is regarding those rows that you generate. 
So it can be done in these two ways. You can generate the row for the slash 22 and then generate specific rows in the way you're disaggregating this for the slash 24 or to generate the gen rows from slash 22 through slash 24. Yeah, there you say that you are publishing this or you disaggregate it up to the slash 24 and you cover all the prefixes that could be delivered in between. For example, slash 23 is also covered by that row that you are generating there. So you can do it in whichever way then. Now, the only thing that you have to bear in mind is if the autonomous system changes where you are publishing the route, if this changes, but it doesn't change or you change that for another autonomous system, you have to create the row indicating that origin autonomous system. Okay, and the last question is, for instance, I think that, well, there are different uh, transit, and in this case, we have, uh, well, the announcer has a database. So let's say that I have a resource and I announce it to them, and they tell me we are going to bring our AR. They, in a few minutes, they create it. So is it necessary there to create the RIR again in another database if they've already done it, or the fact that they do it is enough? Well, I didn't understand the question too well. Now, what I understand is, I think I did understand it. There are certain, um, uh, the, some have their own, uh, um, uh, for their own uh, practice. They will create an RNI object in their own RIR for their uh, infrastructure to enable you the output. Now, going to the question, it's good to publish it in a more public RIRs. The problem is when you no longer want that transit. So there, you have to ensure that they may remove the object that they created because if they don't, I've had, when I worked at an ISP and I experienced that, that personally and I received many questions of things that do things that don't work and it's because there's a 15-year-old object that's lost, even longer than 15 years. So just uh, for you to bear that in mind. Thank you, Carlitos. Thank you for the questions. I wanted to compliment uh, the question by, uh, by a friend about the rented ones of cogent. Most rented cogent uh, in blocks uh, in uh, the Americas are legacy, there with no rears, nor can you create any rows. But you have to certify because cogent can rent some blocks that are under ARIN, for instance, and those blocks you can create the digital row certificates so that you can comply. Now, if they are legacy blocks, the most various, you can't create any objects. Thank you. Well, that's very, Wesley, thank you. I think that everybody has to do listening IPs because you can't buy any. But if you're offered a block, be very cautious about the origin, if it's a legacy or if it's under a service agreement, what's the rear it comes from. And then if you're interested in doing things like RPKI, check what uh, the uh, RIR says, because in RIN, they won't give you services. So we at LACNIC, we do provide RPKI services. The policies there are different. They decided not to. There are many legal issues in North America, so to provide RPKI, they need to subscribe membership uh, agreements. And if they don't, they don't provide the services. In RIPE, there may be, there are different policies that may affect that. And the other big question is, if you do le leasing of IPs, what is the degree of autonomy do you have in the use of those IPs? For instance, you may have modify the uh, who is data, you may create a rowers. So none of them is <laughs> So just know where you stand. Who is is extremely important because of all uh, the uh, legal investigation. Thank you, Wesley and Carlos.
So we answered the question of Cesar Augusto Camacho in the chat about the legacy blocks. So let's go on, because in these four hours, we're trying to cover quite a lot of what we have in routing security. But now we're going to give the floor um, to those uh, new proposals that are being debated to face problems that we continue to see in the RPKI and RIRs. So, so far we've seen the most classic things, so the RPKI and uh, RIR, that are the solutions that have been used so far to solve the routing problems, uh, the inc incidents like uh, route le leaks or hijacks. But how, why is it that we need new tools? RPKI provides a partial solution that is validation of origin. The only thing that we validate with RPKI is the autonomous system of origin of the prefixes, not everything in between. So in the AS path, AS path, we only see the last autonomous system of the AS path, and the prefix may correspond to that, and to um, and the uh, RIR is similar. Uh, but uh, we already saw the problems uh, of the RIR. Sometimes they are not updated, and usually that is that extra information that the RIRs could use is not provided. So what we want to validate, not just the uh, autonomous system of origin, but everything, uh, all the in-between autonomous systems that shouldn't be there, etc. In the leaks, for instance, the autonomous system of origin is preserved, so RPKI is not so good for that. And even when uh, there's no, uh, uh, there was no leak, I could announce a prefix using a false auto uh, uh, autonomous system of origin and putting the one that corresponds to RPKI, so that. Hence, I could be falsifying the path, and I would be making an announcement that uh, RPKI would not be in a position to detect as false. That there were other proposals. BGPSEC was not too well accepted by a provider, so there are others. Here you have the route leak, and uh, the AS path. The autonomous system of origin is preserved. So in that case, where we have a leak, that is 2000 uh, uh, DB810 that leaks uh, to 65512 will be with the correct. Uh, um, but usually the origin is preserved, so the RPKI would be no, no good to change this. And the route hijacking that we see today that was originated by 65509, if it's generated by 65509, this is going to be detected by RPKI. This is the most common now. Is 65509 does something more sophisticated and adds as uh, the 65510, that's the proper one, that will pass. And this will not will be unable to prevent RPKI because RPKI checks the autonomous system of origin and 65510. And in this case, if 65509 were to falsify the autonomous system of origin, then it would pass and would not be prevented by the RPKI. So you could say, well, but 65502 might have filters to prevent learning things uh, originated in 65510 that come from 65. 509 because they know that they're not connected well it could be but we should have a, a finer to our filter so what other proposals do we have well there are several things that we can comment um, some of them have to do with preventing the route leaks. There's an RFC 7908 that Erica will show in just a while that uh, sorts the route leaks. And from then on, 
Well, it's it's important because from then on uh, they identified the different types of route leaks, so they were classified, and from then on they started working more in prevention. And uh, a very interesting case that is using roles in BGP, that is RFC 9234, that Erika will explain. Basically, it allows to define roles when you have peering relations or BGP relations. Usually, you can have two organizations that do peering, or one is a provider, another one is a client, the other is the provider. Now, if you remember, at the beginning when I showed the route leaks, I said, well, we shouldn't uh, uh, transmit uh, what we learn from appearing, not to a provider. And the other way around, what we learn from transit uh, does not have to be transmitted to transit or to appearing. Those rules can be automated through things like the roles. Later on, I'm going to talk about uh, ASPA, an autonomous system provider authorization with the signed uh, prefix list and uh, the RSC. But now let me give the floor to uh, Erika and she will continue with the classification. So, Chicho was mentioning RFC 7908. Remember that the route leak, leak was one of the initial incidents as soon as we started with our tutorial. And specifically, we speak of a route leak when an, an advertising done from an autonomous system goes beyond the advertising um, before the foreseen scope. We start announcing some networks and we start having an impact on other peers with that advertisement. So, well, with they start learning, violating those other policies. Um, so, and we start publishing routes or networks that we shouldn't publish. This RFC is quite important and it's quite good to know it because it was published with uh, information purposes and they show the different cases of uh, route leaks and uh, what gives us different types of route leaks are based on the experience of leaks that were seen in different networks. And here we start uh, classifying those uh, leaks so that we can identify their, them and then start to see how we can mitigate them. So we have six types identified in this RFC. Let me briefly explain each type with a quick uh, topology. The sixth type is those accidental leaks, the basic filtering that we must do in our network when you publish private networks, for instance, with more specific prefixes or prefixes that are being published or used with tests that should not be published in the internet. Let me explain the first type, that is the uh, transit provider to another transit provider. Here we see three different uh, autonomous systems with different uh, po uh, policy routing. Two transit provider, ASN2 and ASN3. We have another ASN that appears in, in between. It receives, it knows the route, the uh, 201db8-40, uh, and should not publish the network. It's learning from its transit provider and publish it to the other publish, uh, to other transit provider. That should not be done. So that first case is called a leak. Uh, um, from one uh, transit provider to another transit provider. So then we have the lateral leaks or peer uh, leaks from one peer to the other. And there in this topology, we have it two transit links, three autonomous systems, and like in this end-to-end -end link is peering, and each of the autonomous systems have the different clients. The client announces some route to the autonomous system 65501, who gives it to the transit provider, and there it's perfect. And anyway, it's a 
informed it to the other transit provider, but that second transit provider should not announce that route to the other peer if that lateral leak should not happen there. This is the prefix leak of one transit provider to a peer uh, provider. So we do it, the uh, transit provider gives information of the route and the autonomous system delivers it to its customers. And so far, well, we everything is okay, but that route is, of a, a transit provider, we should not announce it to advertise and to our peer. This RFC, it's important to know it because it is there that we decide how we should filter our infrastructure and what are the advertisements that we allow or that we should publish and we shouldn't. So let's say that we are, oh, that's a point of departure of some security issues. The leak, prefix leaks from a peer to a transit provider. The same thing happens here. We are sending the information from one peer to another peer. And it learns the route, and that peer can then deliver it to the clients downstream. But this network shouldn't be published if a transit provider would have to log, and it should learn this through the transit provider, this on autonomous system. <clears throat> so the fifth type which is a re-originated prefix changing the origin AS. We have these three ASNs. 65.5.11 is publishing route 21db8.10-48, where the origin AS path is 65.5.11, and the AS path that is created should be viewing 65.5.11 as the origin ASN and going through 65536 AS to reach destination, which is ASN 65512. But if AS 65536 reoriginates slash 48 prefix, putting the AS as origin, this will be learned using a shorter path. This is a distant vector which prioritizes a shorter path. So it, the route leak will be announced from that autonomous system and generate the route, and the route will change considerably. So thanks to that identification, thanks to that typification done to the different types of route leaks, they started to discuss these issues that start to arise despite using the mechanisms we saw previously, such as IRR objects or RPKI objects. So this RFC was created 9234. And in terms of these trends, the two I'm referring to, these two RFCs have already been approved. They're already in production. And the remaining three topics Chicho will be referring to are topics that are being discussed and are draft RFCs. This proposal was standardized in 2022. So it has been discussed at length and has been approved for use. This proposal seeks to use the messages update and open we have in BGP to deliver information to the routers to which we connect, indicating the role that each router will have. We'll be able to assign a role. If you saw in the examples I shared with you regarding route leaks, we have the role of a transit provider, we have the role of a client, we have the role of a ser internet service provider. And in this case, the transit provider role we can also speak of a traffic exchange point that has several members and delivers information to many networks. So this RFC gives the possibility of assigning a role to each of the routers so that when assigning that role, prevent publication of prefixes beyond the roles that should not be sending information from one to another. So these are the three roles we have, the provider role, 
So this can be identified as an internet service provider or an upstream provider or a transit provider. Then we have the client, which is the end user. We have the route server. This could stress that these are the route servers used, for example, in traffic exchange points. Then we have the route server client, which are the clients connected to the IXPs. And then we have the peers, who are those neighbors, the networks connected directly to our network. To bear in mind how these roles are assigned, we have to bear in mind what is the local AS, local AS and the remote AS. The local AS is this router, or this autonomous system where PGP is being executed and that described action is carried out. So we're indicating which of the router roles each router will have. And if it's remote AS, it is the ASN in the other end of the BGP session. So we describe the role of those borders, and the other connection of the other peer will be that remote one. So here we have the only relationships that can be established in the five roles we have. So we have the main relationship, which is provider client and client provider, which is one that can be established without any issues. And once these roles have been defined, the information going through the networks through those routers can be passed and will not be filtered. Then we have the route server to route server client to the different members or clients connected to that route server and vice versa, it should also learn and know the information in the same in those different roles. And then we have peer-to-peer. -peer. This can be established as well, and this should not be filtered or stopped at any moment. So in establishing these roles, the BGP role will know that and will then allow traffic from going from one client, from one role, to a service provider or a route server, uh, to the members of a route server, or from one peer to another peer. So if we see, for example, that we have a client that is connected and has a client role, but wishes to establish a direct connection or pass information from that client to one who has a role of a peer, then this information would be blocked, and then we start to automate that mitigation of route leaks. We had a lab to share with you, but we have run out of time. But during the Q&A session, we can briefly show you how this works. So this has another mode that can be enabled. And if the local AS and the remote AS don't support this, then this RFC, then the, the strict mode is disabled, and it's about respecting the roles between the different routers that were established. So this contains more information on this RFC. So you can read the lead details. There's a quite a good lab done by Alejandro Acosta where you can check out more information on what we have described. And this lab is something that we can look at during the Q&A session. I won't show the lab, but just to give you an example, the router at the center the one at the has the one at the top as a peer. It is a provider of the next one, and it is a client of this other one. So, what it learns from one peer is not forwarded to the one that is a provider, but is forwarded to the ones they have as customers. So this is done automatically, done automatically by the PGP. 
So if you have a peering relationship and another relationship where the other is a transit provider, what we learn through the peer won't be forwarded to the transit provider and what and vice versa, but to the client. So this was done through with communities previously. But this is done now. If the routers support this, it can be done in that way. So you avoid having to manage communities with the same. It's done automatically. The other topic we have, these are drafts. These are proposals and discussion, under discussion. ASPA seeks to f figure out a solution that not only the autonomous system at origin is checked, but also the entire path. This is a major change because these objects are new objects. These are not the rowers. These are other objects signed by the owner of the autonomous system compared to the rowers that were always signed by those who had the prefixes. In the case of ASPA, what I'm going to say is who are my internet providers? Which autonomous systems are my internet providers? I'm going to say my provider is autonomous system number one, number two, number three. If it's done by each of the internet organizations, we can build the provider network. And if there are many organizations that create ASPA resources, you will have pairs. This autonomous system has this provider, and this other one has that other provider, and so on. So in that way, we can build this chain building the path. So if this is a rising path, if it's quite straightforward and I wish to check AS4 that I get with prefixes, I can check, I can verify that that AS path, if it's AS1, AS2, AS3, AS4, I have to verify that AS1 to AS2 exists, then from AS2 to AS3, and from AS3 to AS4, if it exists in the ASPA database. This is simple when you have an interconnection that looks like this, but then in AS7, this is more complicated in that case. We are way beyond the time, but I wanted to finish with this topic. So when you have to check an AS7 that there is an ascending and descending path upstream and downstream, I recommend to check this out in the RFC. This looks even more complicated. This is still being discussed. Hmm. They're about to finish defining this, but it is likely that this will become an RFC shortly. And it's one of the options available. The other one is called RPKI prefix list. This defines an AS defines the prefixes that will be published. And you might ask yourself, but don't we have all that already with rowers? Yes, but this is an alternative. A more explicit way of saying in the ASNs that these are the prefixes we will be publishing. And if it is not there, then this is no longer a valid prefix. So let us skip this. So there is a table that you can have a look at. If it is listed in this prefix list, and if it meets the origin validation, and if it is accepted or rejected. And this is another object that is being discussed. This is quite interesting, because to create a free arbitrary object using RPKI, if you have the resource PKI, you can not only sign the rows, but also any other object. This is an arbitrary object that can be used for those cases when you use bring your own IP or cloud providers. I don't know whether this has happened to you, but when you wish to publish 
your own prefixes in a cloud provider. They ask you to include some things in the WHOIS or in the LACNIC database so that you can verify who owns that IP. So with this, this could also be used in that way. It can also be used for other apps. You can enter an arbitrary object like a text, but this is signed by the resource owner. So in that way, this demonstrates that you use this. So I invite you to read the RFC. So having said this, I'd like to finish here. We had to speed up a bit at the end because the previous one part was a bit long. So let us briefly go to the recommendations. These are to draft RFCs. These are the most recent things. We hope that you keep what we mentioned before. The recommendations for all the organizations are to create your ROAS. Those of you who have your own resources, or if you have a provider, create your ROAS. This is, applies to everyone. Validation of origin, this is well worthwhile. If you receive ROAS from more than one provider, otherwise a routing table containing ROAS from different routers, then we'll have validated. If you only have an outbound router, this won't that is not meaningful because that will be done by the provider. And what we recommend is to keep up to date with the IETF discussions. If you already have routers that support RFC 9234, you can implement the ROAS in BGP. But the recommendation, the basic recommendation is to create the ROAS. Those, all those organizations that have resources, this is a way you can protect yourself from potential route hijacks and attacks. So the way to protect yourself is creating ROS and validation will be done by the others. It is likely that they will do so, but at least as an end user, create the ROAS. So with this, we finished. Thank you for staying uh, until the very last minute. Let me give you some housekeeping announcements. Lunch is at the uh, Bourbon Hotel, at the Gol Olimpico restaurant, and uh, at 2 p.m. we'll meet again here. The secure routing and validation of origin uh, will start. It's 18 UTC for you in Zoom. and. An extra announcement, if you want to take pictures, please uh, share it with uh, LACNIC uh, 42 and LACNOC 2024. So thank you. I hope this was useful for you. This afternoon we'll have uh, the, well, w this afternoon we have the uh, Q&A session. If you have any doubts, um, you have our posts. So. We are ready there to help you.